Greetings everyone, welcome to this video. I am Alessandro, also known as Dark Ages Workshop on the internet. This video is part 3 of my trilogy about the basics of grimdark miniature painting. After covering the mentality in part 1 and the products we'll be using in part 2, here I will show you how I manually approach the painting of a model considering all the things we said in previous videos. Don't be afraid to experiment and play with colors and instruments at your disposal. There is no order or painting method set in stone. Be brave and keep a flexible mind. Now let's dive into it. This is the model I'll be painting today, a plastic macromancer from Games Workshop. I really like the overall pose and feel of the model, but I also feel this staff here is overwhelming for the structure and use of the model I have in mind. I'll be making a cut here, and I'll replace it with something more in line with the use I'm gonna make also with gameplay in mind. When I'm in doubt, the Empire Flagellants kit has always the right answer for me. So I'll be using this Morningstar, give it a little filing and see if it fits nicely. These bells would make for a nice adornment and will help it be coherent with a low fantasy necromancer theme. Now I glue everything in place with plastic cement glue and I'm noticing the way this clock is moving. It has this forward motion, like I guess the wind coming from behind, or rather as if the model is moving backwards, slithering, cunning and malicious. So I glue the bells to follow the same movement as the cloak. I'm checking the size of the mini from the top because I personally don't like when poses and bits peek out of the trim of the base. Ideally, I want the bells resting on the shoulder, and it would have made sense since iron bells are heavier than a piece of cloak, but ultimately I'm satisfied with this. I chose this miniature for this tutorial because it contains cloth, skin, and now some metal with the added morning star on top. The cloak already had some nice wrinkles sculpted in, but I definitely want more. I'll be using AK Interactive Dark Earth on the lowest parts of the cloak here. Mordant Earth is a crackle paint by Citadel range, and when applied, the thicker the layer is, the larger will be the cracks. I play with it, no water, and stipple it where I find it will be interesting to see. This crackle paint needs a good shock of heat after being applied, so I use 20 seconds of hair dryer, making sure I don't melt my plastic model. The priming stage is often underestimated, relegated to the tedious thing that has to be done in order to make the next layers have a better grip. It's not just about that. Consider the priming stage as your real first stage of painting and the foundation to build up your chromatic values. I'm going to apply a dark paint and a light paint on top, imagining the model in a neutral condition of illumination with light coming from the top of his head. I'll be using an airbrush here as I feel I have more control of what I'm doing 
and also it's undeniably fast. Feel free to use a brush or a rattle can instead. I will be starting with a matte black, covering the entire model. I'll add 10 minutes to dry and I'll be using this Steiner Res Grey Primer. It's optional that you use grey and you could easily skip and go directly to white, but I like it because it will make some nice mid-tone transitions. I will be spraying this almost from the top, roughly at a 45 degrees angle, paying attention not to cover all the black areas. I want some of that black to still be there and act as a realistic shadow for the model. Don't be scared to leave some recesses black and unpainted when modeling in the grimdark style. Finally, I'll be using a white ink, spraying perpendicularly to the head of the model. This is called a zenithal priming. I don't want to cover all the grey and absolutely not the black areas here. Mind that, you don't have to use zenithal priming because someone on the internet told you so, but because it has a specific purpose. The next layers will consist in very watery, transparent washes and contrast paints, used as base colors. Having this white, grey, black transition makes it so that in the bright areas the transparent color will tint the white and will be at its brightest. In the grey area it will be a mid-tone. In the black area it will almost be black. As previously said, I'll be going to take advantage of the zenithal prime here using contrast paints and washes. I will tint the surfaces, letting the primer do all the work for me regarding placement of realistic lighting and shadows. I'll be using a very limited palette consisting of earthy and cold tones. I suggest not to choose dark colors here for this stage as in a later stage, with oils, we will darken pretty much all the miniature. From my wet palette, I splash these contrast paints directly onto the model and mix them on the surface itself. In this stage, I work very rationally and my intent is to just lock the lighting in, the contrast of warm and cold tones and I absolutely don't care about making mistakes, as I can fix them at any moment in later stages. I always work from general to specific, and any mistake that comes in the way will be fixed afterwards in some way or another. I want this cloak a grey, bluish, heavy fabric non-reflective but coherent with the colors of the ill-lit streets of Mordheim. So I'm not scared to add some Gilliman flesh or snakebite leather and add some of the colors used for the cloak also on the scalp and face, of course very watered down. When painting stone, the easiest mistake is to paint them in monochrome grey. They all have all sorts of reflections and compositions. Apply this mentality to different materials, like this cloak. I add some black templar and wildwood on the very ends of the cloak, toward the base, to establish depth and shadow. I just keep working on it, adding brush strokes on top almost actively seeking for those coffee stain effects that most people hate about contrast paints. I want those stains for surface interest. 
This cloak is worn out and has seen some terrible dank places. Contrast paints take some time to dry, so I will now focus on the skin. I want this necromancer's skin to be pale and sick. I will use Rykland Flesh Shade watered down a lot, with almost no pigment on the brush, mostly water. Like one part wash, three parts water. I slowly build up these shades around the eyes and scalp and that gnarly hand and the knuckles. This stage requires patience, as watered down washes will take more time to dry and you need two to three passes to make a slow build up. I'm gonna do the same with Carver Crimson. Water down the same manner, focusing more around the eye sockets and the knuckles, but also on the scalp. I want that head on top to be veiny and absolutely unhealthy, so I try to go with thin capillary lines. As for this color, I want it to be like a membrane resembling bat wings or soon flaps of flesh. I will be using Collier Green Shade in the recesses to make the flesh appear completely devoid of life and somehow reflect the cloak. Then, Reichland Flesh Shade again on top. Now it's time to take some off-white paints, re-establish some light where needed, make some highlights and painted surface modulation, and eventually fix some mistakes. I want these skulls primed with Ruckert flesh and some more highlights in areas of interest of the model such as the brows, eyes, teeth, hair, fingers and the collar. By mixing some off-white with Kolya green shade, I can make a good color to highlight this cloak and go with a dotting technique. I really like to do this on clothes to reflect heavy weathering, patches, soon parts, scratches and marks. I look for all the wrinkles and try to make them more visually important.
Now, white and a green-gray to make some extreme highlights. Again, skulls, hair, eyes, fingernails, and again the membrane of the color, just some extremities. For the morning star, I chose to do nothing too complicated. I clean off the excess of some lead belcher and apply it on the head of the weapon and bells. For the second bell, I use a nice Rune Lord brass. Then I will dilute some riser rust with water and apply a big chunk of it. We actually want this chunk of paint to dry and shrink and add some volume of simulated corrosion. Now that the base colors are all applied, we could jump to the next stage. But as I mentioned in part 2, using contrast paints and watches as base colors make for a very thin and weak layer of paint. And I'd be concerned to accidentally peel off the paint with a Q-tip and white spirit afterwards. I use a nice AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish. Now the model has nice color variations highlights, interesting surfaces. I consider the face and flesh almost completely done, but the rest lacks something. It's kind of flat, it lost its shadow values a little, so it's time to apply some enamels and oils to make some filters. I prepare a Q-tip, white spirit and a good sized brush and start applying AK Interactive Streaking Grime pretty much all over the cloak. Then, rust streaks applied on weapons. I add also some rust streaks on the cloak to have some more interesting colors. I absolutely don't want any enamel on flesh areas. While the streaking grime dries, I will use the AK Interactive Dark Brown Wash and start addressing the base. It will be a great foundation color for the ground, and I apply it liberally all over the base. To make things interesting on the base, I will use Abtelum 502 Neutral Grey on those grazed areas and rocks. Then, some streaks and pools of burnt umber for an impression of earth rich in clay. I mix these grey brownish pigments from Abtelum 502 with mineral spirit to create a paste and apply it on some spots of the base to create further interest and variations. These oils on the base will mix wonderfully in the end with very little effort. With the base done fast and simple, it's time to remove the streaking grime from a model. I use a Q-tip dipped in mineral spirit and start removing the enamel in downward strokes. For some places, a brush will be better, so feel free to exchange between the two, depending on the surface and the amount to remove. I remove the majority 
but the enamel has already stained the surface. As you can see, now it's a grey blue with rotten and grimy green hues. I apply the same pigments used on the base, also on the ends of the cloak. I find it gives coherency. AK Interactive Decay Deposits is a grey-green enamel that simulates rot and decay on materials. I want to do something creative here. I dip a brush with ruined and spreaded bristles in mineral spirit, then get some decay deposits and start splattering with my finger all over the cloak, trying to not go over the top. Of course it was too much on there, but there's no problem. We can remove decay deposits with a Q-tip with white spirit to cancel it completely, or a dry Q-tip to smear it or make the splatters more subtle and smooth. Copper Patina Oxide from Absolute Fiber 2 is an oil that will dry extra powdery will simulate the effects of oxide corrosion. I use it on the rusted parts of the weapons, but you will see in a little that I regret how this weapon turned out. It's time to apply some actual dark shadows to the model. I would use a black oil wash, but everything on this previous layer is oil, so I would be concerned to reactivate it. So I dry it with a hair dryer and prefer using an acrylic wash instead, the good old Noln Oil. I can use the acrylic wash on top of the oil pigments, because all the white spirit has been flashed off with the hair dryer. And the Abtilum oil pigments were very lightly applied. Also, Abtilum paints contain less linseed oil as we stated before, so they will dry faster. So, with the Noln oil, I really focus on the crevices and the lines of separations of different materials and features. Some Noln oil also on the metal parts, just on the lower areas. Here I adjust the color to have a more vibrant crimson and veiny hue. Now that 95% of the model is complete, I want to see some color that goes in contrast with that cloak, because it takes the majority of the model. I still wanted to have some fun on the cloak and demonstrate here how you can add variations in creative ways. I did it previously with decay deposits, now I do some splattering effect using the snake bite leather contrast paint with a smaller brush diluted with water and more gently. These very little dots and splatters are definitely more in scale with the model. I always enjoy using these creative ways to add variations. With Iron Breaker, I will relight that metal colors on weapons, as I felt that rusted effect didn't do the job. The main focus of the figure are the face and the cloak. I really didn't want to have another element of interest. I felt it was overdone and, quite frankly, not my best one. This is finally looking how I imagined it. The enamels give the cloak a dusty, yet humid and damp finish. The flesh, after some satin varnish, will look sweaty, porous and gnarly. The metallic brings a little bit more brightness in. And lastly, the base rim is painted black. 
and I can call this model done. I hope you found this video interesting, informative and immersive. This video, rather than a recipe, to me was more a fun way to demonstrate how flexible one can be when painting miniatures, and how stress-free and creative it can be. I reiterated some techniques such as highlights and glazing and washes numerous times throughout the video, even repeating them if necessary to follow a creative vision. With this video, my trilogy for the basics of grimdark painting is done, but more videos will come in the future, covering my takes on some recipes like flesh, corroded metal, black armor, speed painting or more elaborate techniques, and what I feel like doing at the moment or by request. I would be glad if you can leave a like and subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to receive future updates. If you can afford and if you learned something useful from this video, I'll leave my Ko-Fi link in the description open for donation. It will help me being more consistent and present on the channel. Stay safe and see you soon.